growing certified organic heirloom and specialty crops within a five-year rotation of small grains, oil seeds, broadleaf and legume crops, Malikas Farms practices advanced land stewardship at a scale that matters. Pursuing sustainability for their farm as a whole, they are partnering with MSU Northern to further the use of biodiesel and an exorcist society through an NRCS conservation initiative grant to develop pollinator practices that are more aligned with organic farming systems. Valikas Farms makes extensive use of cover crops, including fall seeded grains, various annual and biannual legumes, and cocktail mixes. Please welcome Doug Crabtree. Thanks. Um, helping me out with the presentation today, uh, Nathan Austin Fowl has worked as our apprentice for this growing season and continues to do so for another few weeks. So, uh, Nathan's going to pitch in. Uh, the name of our farm, you might be wondering, um, Valicus is a Latin word for one of the two they have in that language for farmer, and translated literally it, it means steward of the land, and that's what we aspire to be. Uh, some of the pictures you'll see here, these are all from our farm over the last five years, um, hopefully most of them the last two or three. We grow a lot of uh, uh, intercropping, and you know, that in particular is, is kamut with flax growing under it. Uh, so you'll see any pictures, if you have questions you can ask or, or come up with later, we'll try and tell you what we're looking at. Nathan, I think this is going to be your slide. Yeah, um, most of this was actually covered just a second ago, so I don't suppose we've got to restate most of this, but um, uh, the only thing I guess we didn't mention, though, you know, we grew 21 different crops this season anyway in that five-year rotation. So, so uh, he mentioned we, you know, we value uh, conservation practices uh, very highly and, and they're a very integral part of our operation. So um, part of that, we, we keep a, a lot of our land base uh, in, in non-crop for, for some of, uh, for habitat protection and uh, erosion protection and different things. Um, we also are working to develop an apprenticeship program. I'm the, the first apprenticeship, the first apprentice in that program. Um, but uh, Doug and Ann have done a lot of work to uh, to make that a, a good program uh, aimed at, at bringing new beginning farmers into this kind of farming system uh, in this part of the country. Um, yeah, I guess know. that's just a summary statement. You know, our overall purpose, I guess, is develop a more sane system of farming. And uh, to, to me or to us, that means lower input costs, higher value crops, and less reliance on uh, purchase technology, resulting in greater rewards to our own management. Uh, first, I want to talk just briefly about some of our farming philosophies that may color what we do and, and how we do it. First of all, we don't grow food using poisons. We don't believe in that and, and don't practice it. We believe nature is the best teacher. We try to follow what, uh, what nature would do and emulate that as best we can in our farming system. We think farming is the highest and best calling, the most important job anyone can have. I think farmers must be professional land stewards if there's to be any sustainability in what we do. We believe farming can and must be practiced in a manner that improves the soil and the surrounding natural resources. We believe that tillage is the art of farming. And as my, one of my mentors, Wendell Berry, said, that the best fertilizer uh, are the farmer's boot prints. So, with those deep thoughts, I'll let Nathan Tell you a little more about our stewardship practices. Um, these are some of the conservation practices that we integrate into our system. Um, some of these we've mentioned, I won't go into much depth on them uh, because we want to get to cover crops, uh, except for, I want to say, you know, continuous cropping is probably one that's really the most pertinent to what we're talking about. Um, it's really a, a fundamental part of our system, uh, and, and what really underlies that is, is that we feel that it's, it's more ecologically and, and agronomically beneficial in the long run to uh, maximize the use of that limited water resource. Um, 
and that's that's kind of that's part of why we do cover crops. We don't um, we don't have a fallow year. We don't advocate having a fallow year because uh, we feel it's more valuable to have something growing that uses that water resource and builds organic matter and hummus in the soil and feeds organisms. Um, so I guess that kind of leads us into cover crops. So. I, I will say a little bit more. Uh, about our, our system, we, we basically have a five-year crop rotation, and one of those years is uh, a green manure crop, which we incorporate um, sometimes before June 15th, but not always. Uh, so that sort of takes the place of a fallow year in our system, if you will. It's green fallow, we call it. Um, and the strip farming, we do that a little differently than most. We have. Uh, mostly 240 foot crop strips that alternate with uh, 15 to 30 foot strips that are left in permanent sod and, and cover crop and, and some of them seeded to uh, pollinator friendly species and across all of our fields. So that's part of that 20 percent that's devoted to conservation purposes. So why do we do cover crops? Because uh, we don't like to look like that. Um, Mother Nature does not like to be naked. So one way that we put it, uh, it takes a lot of energy to keep uh, an unnatural state such as this. Uh, energy in the form of uh, pesticides, energy in the form of tillage if you're doing it that way. Um, so we, we try to find an alternative. And uh, what we've observed over the years is if we don't cover her nature with something, she'll cover herself with something and we probably won't like that as well as our choice. <coughs> Uh, we, we grow three types of cover crops, uh, fall seeded, uh, spring legumes, um, and, and those cocktail mixes which some of the other speakers have spoken about. Um, this would be winter wheat here, uh, other pictures are coming up. This is chickling vetch spring legume that we plant, and that's a cocktail mix, and the flower there is Vesalia, which is one of those fibrous crops that helps break up soil. And I, I should add, we grow winter wheat primarily as a cover crop. We uh, Occasionally we save it for harvest, but generally we consider that a, a cover crop species on our farm. So, uh, kick off, uh, the fall seeded crops, as I said, the, the first and primary one we use is winter wheat. Uh, purposes of that are to provide both winter and early spring cover, preventing erosion. We find that especially beneficial when it's preceding a late seeded crop. Um, it helps us control spring weeds uh, as easy to, easy to uh, acquire and, and relatively inexpensive seed. Winter wheat establishes easily and terminates easily. Those are benefits. Another, go ahead. Um, this is a rye crop that we've used in the past, um, but we don't really use it so much anymore because it's so aggressive at establishing and, um, and, and then coming back the, the following year uh, in, in the next crop uh, it tends to reseed itself very readily. Uh, and it's, it's not as easy to terminate uh, as the winter wheat. Um, it, it, it is a, a, you know, a very strong plant, but sometimes that's, that's not exactly what we want for its cover crop. Its best features are also its, its biggest drawbacks. Uh, well, Austrian winter peas are another we've tried. Um, we really like the idea of a fall seeded legume, but at our location we have not been able to get it successfully through the winter. I think about 20% was the best survival rate we've, we've seen. So uh, we've sort of given up on that one. Um, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, so uh, with fall crops, we usually seed half or three quarters of the regular rate. And uh, September is kind of the ideal month there, or maybe early October for planting some of that. Uh, we use primarily two different planters. The one that showed in the previous picture, which is our air seeder. And this is a, a hoe drill which we would use more for no-till situations, which you can see here where we're planting into crop residue. Um, and over on the right-hand side is actually the side of that strip which has been tilled. 
So we'll do, you know, sometimes do a no-till, sometimes uh, tillage. And some of that tillage is actually accomplished with the air seeder, which has 14-inch sweeps that, you know, for this situation, it's not important to have a, a you know, perfect uh, job of terminating any weeds that are there, but so one pass is, is sometimes adequate. We do a lot of the spring termination of crops with a chisel plow, which uh, will, will generally run fairly shallow, uh, although it can be run a lot deeper. Um, but it does a good job of termination and, and some incorporation. So I, I would add to that that, as I said, we, we really like to use these fall cover crops prior to a late spring seeded crop, like safflower or sunflower. So we may not be doing this termination until mid-May or even after that. So it gives it a time to get established and, and have some benefit. The next thing I want to talk about were uh, the legume green manures. Uh, we use these extensively in our system. Uh, the first one, uh, sweet clover, which we underseed with the previous year's crop. Generally seeded at about five pounds to the acre using a, a Valmar air seeder. Uh, the establishment really seems to depend on the year. Some years it's great, some years not very good at all. Um, Clover terminates well if you get to it early enough, but can also be very difficult if, if for some reason you're late. Um, and there's a picture of the cedar we use to put blow on, as we say, sweet clover over the top prior to uh, seeding the principal crop. Um, couple things, points on the sweet clover. Uh, this is a picture of immediately following termination. Um, generally, this is going to require two passes uh, on the sweet clover. We've tried to do it with a blade plow, which we'll talk about more later, is, is our, always our favorite tool for terminating cover crops. Um, we like the sweet clover. It, it provides a lot of nitrogen and, and, in particular, a lot of organic matter into our system. Peas are a crop we've used in the past also. Um, they, they do establish well, um, and, and they're a good, a good green manure crop. The, the main drawback is, is the high cost of the seed. It, it's not a very, uh, I guess, not a very feasible uh, crop to use as a green manure um, as compared to, say, chickling vetch, which Doug will talk more about later. So one of the things we do like about peas, uh, they terminate for us very easily. Um, we, we are able to use, that's a picture there of peas immediately after we've run a noble blade. Uh, they provide, depending on what literature you read, and, and uh, my best guess, I guess, is 20 to 40 pounds of, of in, total in. And their, their residue, while it's initially big, it, it does break down very readily. So. Uh, you know, that could be a positive or a negative, but it's an observation. Um, the one that we've come to use most often as our legume green manure is chickling vetch. And this is a picture, if you're not familiar with uh, growing chickling vetch cover crop. Uh, we seed that about the same time as you would peas, anytime between middle of March and middle of May. <coughs> uh, the, the real advantage, or, or one of the real advantages, is uh, approximately half the seed rate as you use with peas, and we're able to save our own seed, so it's, uh, you know, it doesn't cost any more than a pea in that regard, so we, uh, we just find it into much more economical. Um, established as well, again, very similar to a pea. Well, one thing with the chickling vetch, it has much less top growth, so what we believe that, that equates to is less water use, you know, less evapotranspiration, uh, on the downside of that, it is definitely less competitive, and we have more, more weeds or biomass <laughs> that we didn't intend when we grow vetch. I don't know that I can document this, but I believe there's at least as much, if not more, nitrogen coming out of a chickling vetch crop. Um, the, the literature suggests that they have uh, more underground biomass, more nodulation compared to a pea. I would, I would say our experience is they are at least as good in terms of producing nitrogen. 
There's another close-up of terminating vetch, and Nathan will tell you some more about that. So this is this is a blade plow terminating the chickling vetch crop, uh, and, and most of you probably know that that tool's designed to cut through the root layer and terminate the crop without substantially disturbing or mixing the soil. Um, this this would be you know several days after termination, not of the same crop, but of a chicken bench crop. Um, and and this, this would not be an ideal job. You, the, ideally, there wouldn't be as much, you know, visible disturbance, you know, but uh, it, it, it varies depending on soil and the crop and residue conditions, so. So one, one thing we really like about this tool is that it leaves much of the above ground uh, cover in place and uh, really continues that erosion control benefit and also uh, limits further evapotranspiration from the soil after the termination. Uh, a new thing for us that we, we tried for the first time this year and, and are really kind of excited about is uh, these cover crop cocktails and the specific mix that we seeded on a little over 100 acres this year was a chickling vetch, oat, turnip, radish, and phasalia blend. We used two different seeding methods. And, uh, I guess this is our, our Valmar from the back side. We used that for the small seeds, blew them on ahead of the seeder. And the larger seeds, we use this bigger air seeder, which is our, our also a regular planter for, for the other crops. But those would be chickling veg and oats and uh, winter wheat and peas and for planting the rye, all those seeds can be used. This. How deep were you going down on that? Depends on the crop, but I think in this case, um, well, you know, the small seeds, as I said, we blew those on ahead, and uh, so that would be variable, whatever, whatever the effect of the the sweeps plus the harrow was. But the uh, vetch and and oat seeds were going about an inch to an inch and a half deep. So that's a picture of some of the cover crop mix. Uh, specific reasons for, for the components, the, the turnip and radish are both deep rooted and are said to help relieve soil compaction. <coughs> also will reach further down in the soil profile to, to bring up nutrients. An inch and a half deep, what spacing? We have a, uh, uh, Split row, I guess you'd say, it, the 14 inch centers and, and two rows surrounding that, so we end up with seven and a quarter inch net <coughs> row spacing. I don't think I've heard anybody mention inoculation on the legumes yet. Do you, do you do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are specific inoculants for each species. Uh, you know, some, you know, some peas and lentils you can use the same inoculant, but you always want to check and be sure you've got the proper inoculant for the species you're seeding. We have seen the difference. If for some reason we do a skip and uh, go back and dig them up and the nodules are not generally present. Okay, the, uh, the oats, generally, the biggest reason we put them in the mix is for weed control. As Klain found in one of his trials, they seem to grow pretty readily and provide cover and, and keep other things uh, Cheat grass, for instance, from filling that gap. There's also uh, anecdotal <laughs> thoughts I've always heard from older farmers that oats are a soil conditioner, and I will attest that when we grow oats, it always seems to be a nice situation afterwards. Uh, they, we, they fill that role in the mix. Vesalia, that may be one that's less familiar. It's also called uh, you know, bee plant or uh, um, a pollinator attracting species, very shallow rooted but, but wide rooted and uh, so it, it has some surface soil conditioning effect. Um, we, we really like to always have a blooming or a pollinator friendly plant in any, any mix we plant. So. so we generally disc to, to both terminate and incorporate uh, these summer green manure crops. Um, it's you know it's the only tool that really works on this scale that, that can handle that amount of foliar mass. Um, so this would be a picture of that. Yeah. We find um, 
With the blade plow, in order for it to work effectively, you have to be able to get under the roots. So if you have a deep-rooted crop or a mix in which some are deeper rooted, it's not very effective. So that's where we sort of fall back to a, to a tandem disc. And this would be immediately after disking. And then uh, 24 hours after, um, you can see the turnips that were planted, they, they tend to get thrown up and... Louder! Oh, sorry. <laughs> this was sort of a hard exercise. We, when we disc this, you know, we, we, I guess we weren't aware how many turnips there actually were there. If you plant two and a half pounds of the acre, you don't think about how much you'll get, but um, we went out with some buckets and gathered them and had supper one night, but uh, then within two days you could smell the turnips uh, fermenting, I guess, in, in the sun, so it, it was quite a voracious crop for us this year at least. Um, there was a lot of regrowth due to the, the rain, so it, it definitely required a second disking this season anyway. Um, even the turnips and radishes tended to regrow. Um, so, yeah, when we went out in, what was that, late August, we yeah. had regrowth of, of turnips that were setting seed and um, had one strip that we were encouraged by, by some visiting folks to, uh, to consider harvesting for seed. Given the price of it, that maybe wouldn't have been a bad idea, but with the rest of harvest going on, this seemed like the quicker approach. Well, that's... A brief glimpse, I guess, of our place and what we do. We just